Hello, listeners. I apologize in advance for mispronouncing many of the words and names in this episode. I researched how to say them, but I still probably won't get them quite right, as I'm not a native speaker of Hindi or any of the many other languages spoken in India, nor of Persian, which was spoken by the Mughal court during the time period we are going to talk about. Thank you for understanding. Humans are fascinated by gore and violence, but even more so the mysterious and unsolved. Interest in these disturbing and unpleasant subjects is called morbid curiosity, and it has gripped hundreds of people throughout the ages. I am one of those people. My name is Hallie, and this is the Morbid Curiosity Podcast. Tales of tragedy are often repeated over and over again in the press, especially when the tragedy involves the deaths of many people. Humans can't seem to look away, as most of us here in the creepy community know. Some humans, however, try to take advantage of tragedy, try to bend the story in some way that benefits them. The history of colonialism is full of this type of exploitation, and in this episode, I want to talk about one such incident that was used by some in power to justify British rule in India during the mid-1800s. The popular version of the story holds that after the British East India Company was defeated at Fort William by the Nawab, or ruler of Bengal, on the 20th of June, 1756, a catastrophic number of people died while imprisoned. That night, it's said that the survivors of the battle, all 146 of them, were crammed into a small dungeon in the fort called the Black Hole. This dungeon is said to have been only 18 feet by 14 feet 10 inches, with a square footage of around 270 feet. That's 4.3 by 5.5 meters and 25 square meters. The prisoners were left in the dungeon for the entirety of a warm night, with only two windows to circulate air. By morning, it's said that only 23 of them were left alive, the rest having been suffocated or pressed to death. One hundred years after this event, the Victorians were obsessed with the tale, specifically the account of one of the survivors, a man named John Zephaniah Howell. Even while some scholars questioned the truth of his tale, most people took it as fact. So many people believed it that some took advantage of the fear it evoked and advanced political arguments for a British state in India. This argument succeeded, and a British Raj was installed in 1857. This story has made the rounds in modern morbid media as well, and like a lot of the stories that circulate in the media, as I researched it, a more likely, more evidence-based truth was quickly revealed. But before I get to that, I want to give some historical context. Fort William, the location where this event took place, was located in Calcutta, now known as Kolkata, which at the time of this event was a new major trade center for the region of Bengal. Bengal is a historical region in the eastern part of India, sitting at the apex of the Bay of Bengal. The area is currently divided between Bangladesh and the Indian state of West Bengal, but at the time of the Black Hole incident, it was its own geopolitical region. It was ruled by the Mughal Empire until 1757, and during their rule, Bengal became the center of the muslin and silk trade. At this time, the Mughal Empire was in control of Bengal, however, they were not as mighty as they had been in previous centuries. For almost 200 years, the Mughal Empire had maintained relative peace and prosperity throughout their empire, which included what is now northern Afghanistan, the Indus Basin, Kashmir, and the highlands of Assam. The empire gained wealth through a series of agricultural taxes paid in well-regulated silver currency. 
The empire gained further wealth when it began to trade with European powers, who craved spices and silks. Because of this growing wealth and export of raw materials, Bengal caught the attention of several European trading companies, the Dutch East India Company, the British East India Company, and the French East India Company were all created around the same time in the early 1600s to take advantage of trade in East India. The Dutch East India Company was created to protect Dutch trade in the Indian Ocean. They soon became the center of power in the Dutch East Indies, what we now call Indonesia. They also had a monopoly on ocean trade for an extended period of time between the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa and the Straits of Magellan in southern Chile. The French East India Company was founded to compete with the Dutch and British East India Companies for trade rights. They were able to set up successful colonies on the island of Mauritius, off the coast of Madagascar, but by the time they had established themselves in India, they were near bankruptcy. As the Mughal Empire began to decline, the French East India Company began to intervene in Indian political affairs in order to protect their interests, notably by forging alliances with local rulers in southern India and attempting to pit them against the British East India Company. The British East India Company was formed when the British Crown granted a group of London knights and merchants a charter to wrest some of the spice trade in the East Indies from the Dutch. They were unable to take over the whole trade, but did set up trading posts in Calcutta and Madras, now known as Chennai. Over time, the British East India Company hired troops as employees to defend their trading posts from other European powers as well as indigenous inhabitants of India. The company ballooned into a megacorporation with outposts around the globe, intense wealth, a private army, and a large amount of political power. In 1698, the company legally purchased Calcutta, Govindpur, and Shutanuti, three small fishing villages which eventually grew into the colonial city of Calcutta. Before the British East India Company established their trading post, Calcutta was a small agricultural and fishing village. The presence of the company expanded its borders and its population, making it into a large trade center. However, the indigenous population didn't benefit from this as much as the European newcomers who emigrated there to work for the company. Fort William was built in 1696 on the eastern bank of the Huli River, which runs through Calcutta. The original brick building was two stories tall with two projecting wings, roughly in the shape of an octagon, where three sides faced the water and the rest faced the town. A dry moat, or ditch, around 29 feet deep and 49 feet wide, or 9 meters deep and 15 meters wide, was dug around it in 1742. This ditch, known as the Muratha Ditch, as well as several other refortifications at the fort, were the reason it was targeted by the Nawab of Bengal, but I'll get to that in a moment. Rapid collapse of the Mughal Empire began between 1707 and 1720, when the empire ran out of money, its power became decentralized, and the several wars it was raging against another empire, the Muratha Empire, exhausted much of its energy. After the execution of the last emperor, Farouk Siyar, in 1719, the empire broke up into several smaller independent Mughal kingdoms, one of these being Bengal. An emperor or crown prince ruled over these states, but had far less power than previous Mughal emperors. In 1756, Siraj Udawla was appointed as Nawab of Bengal. His ascension, however, was contested. Siraj Udawla was the grandson of the previous Nawab, Alivardi Khan, who he had been quite close to. His life story is a fascinating one and includes enough intrigue to warrant an HBO miniseries at least. This whole period of the Mughal Empire would be a great HBO series, but I digress. Siraj Udawla's ascension was opposed by Mir Jafar, a military general who was previously part of the rival Muratha Empire, which ruled over most of the Indian subcontinent from 1674 to 1818. Mir Jafar had been a senior official under the Muratha Empire, but defected to follow Alivardi Khan, but was rejected as an advisor by Siraj Udawla. The new Nawab was also opposed by his aunt, Gassetti Begum, and his cousin, Shakat Jang. 
Moving swiftly, Siraj Udala quelled their opposition and gained the full power of the Nawab of Bengal. He then turned his attention to the European powers that were quickly buying up and moving into his lands. During the contest of succession over the position of Nawab, the British East India Company made its move. The company claimed they had the right to unrestricted, duty-free trade. They sometimes withheld cargo unless bribes were paid. Officials of the company tried to pass off their own private goods as company goods to exempt themselves from paying fees. The company also bought up small villages, and if Mughal officials denied them, they would go forward with the purchase under the name of one of their Indian employees. Many times, when they legally purchased a village, the company only paid a small percentage of the asking price. This last method is how they came to own Calcutta. The company began to build up fortifications at Fort William in September 1755, in preparation for the spread of the Seven Years' War to Calcutta. This European war between Britain and its allies, and France and its allies, spread to many of their colonies, including the United States, where it's known as the French and Indian War. This refortification of trading posts in Bengal did not escape the notice of the Nawab. He felt his authority was being challenged. There was already tension between the Nawab and the British East India Company, as he suspected they had tried to aid those who had been against him, or at least tried to profit from his contested ascension. We don't know for sure that this is true, but in any case, the Nawab suspected them, and the company would have profited from a power vacuum. The Nawab sent a letter to the governor of Calcutta, Roger Drake, asking that the company desist in erecting any new fortifications and to fill the ditch that surrounded the town and fort. Drake replied by having the messenger ejected from town and stating that there were no new fortifications. The company was repairing the fort after a recent attack by the French East India Company. Having just won over his challengers in the Mughal court, the Nawab was furious when the British East India Company rejected his orders. He decided a show of force was needed to remind the European powers who ruled Bengal. Hearing this, Drake ordered the commencement of hostilities. On June 10, 1756, he sent a detachment of soldiers to the nearby town of Suksagar to cause panic, and another to Thana Fort at the narrowest part of the Huli River. Both detachments were expelled on the 11th by the Nawab's advanced guard. On the 16th of June, the Nawab reached the outskirts of Calcutta with some 30,000 troops and heavy artillery. The company forces set fire to many outlying straw homes in order to clear the town of any hidden Nawab soldiers. They set up their defenses around the European quarter of town, what is now Dalhousie Square, and the eastern and southern areas around it. All European women and children were brought into the fort. On the 17th, all Armenian and Indian Portuguese women and children were brought into the fort as well, as the Armenian and Indian Portuguese militia refused to fight alongside the company unless their families were kept safe. The majority of the Nawab's troops crossed the Muratha Ditch on the 18th, and the battle began. The company soldiers were ordered to give no quarter, as the prison in Fort William, the Black Hole, was too small to take any more prisoners. The Nawab's men attacked from the east and south, occupying the strongly built abandoned houses of the Europeans. This made the fort's artillery ineffective against them. The battery outside the fort was quickly abandoned, leaving it for the Nawab to take. The company's soldiers fell back further and further toward the fort. The small space became cramped, so that night, all the women and children were quietly sent away on wading ships in the river. That cleared space, but the soldiers that were left defending the fort were exhausted, without food, and running out of ammunition. Around 1 or 2 a.m. on June 19th, Governor Drake held a council, and it was decided that the fort should be abandoned, but he was uncertain how to do so. When the sun rose, confusion broke out. The ships that had been prepared in case of evacuation were gone, and the defenders were too scared or too tired to fight. When the ships finally did appear, there was a stampede toward them. Drake escaped on one of these ships and made it to the company base in Falta, just down the river from Fort William. 
Several ships were filled to the brim, but unfortunately ran aground soon after launching. Those aboard were captured by the Nawab's men. Fort William had been abandoned by its governors, but still contained around 170 European men who were still capable of fighting. A council of the survivors appointed John Howell, the town magistrate and tax collector, as governor and commander. Howell ordered that they make a stand, but the heavy musket fire of the Nawab's men from the occupied European houses made it impossible to stand on the fort's ramparts without being shot. On Sunday, June 20th, 53 Dutch soldiers deserted the fort and joined the Nawab. Howell decided to try for a ruse. He flew a flag of truce, hoping to make an escape at nightfall, but the Nawab's men scaled the walls of the fort around 4 p.m. A group of Dutch soldiers guarding one of the gates let the attacking army in, and Howell quickly surrendered. The Indian Portuguese and Armenian militia that were left inside the fort were allowed to leave. Several Europeans left with them in the confusion. There is still some controversy today over just how many European defenders were taken prisoner after the battle, which I'll get to after the break. Whatever their numbers, the defeated company men were searched and their weapons and valuables removed, but they were otherwise well treated. Howell met with the Nawab three times, and he was assured that no harm would come to them. There was, however, nowhere to keep so many prisoners, so they were scattered all around the fort. Later that evening, around 7 p.m., according to Howell, several prisoners found a stash of alcohol and became drunk and disorderly. They verbally abused the Nawab's guards and apparently assaulted some of them. Many were put in restraints. When some of the more sober prisoners were asked if the fort had a prison, the Nawab's men were told about the Black Hole, a small cell that was also used as a storeroom near the center of the fort. Either the guards did not examine the size of the room, or perhaps they were feeling malicious. Whatever the case, the guards herded every single prisoner into the black hole. Before we discuss what happened next and the controversy surrounding it, let's pause for a word from our sponsors. Hello everyone, let me tell you about the Apple for the Teacher podcast. I'm Anna Thomas, a teacher and your host. So you're probably thinking it's about reading, writing and arithmetic, right? Well, think again. It's a fresh take on true crime, where you wouldn't expect to find true crime. In schools, yes, schools. You will hear tragic stories about murder, abduction, school bus hijack, student disappearance, suicide, kidnap and ransom, a school camp tragedy, the list goes on. So if you're looking for something a little different in the true crime genre, then Apple for the Teacher is for you. So join me as I present the bad apples. But until then, remember to be a good apple. Lastly, if you like this podcast, why not sponsor the MCP yourself by becoming a patron on Patreon? Over 30,000 people download this podcast every month, but only around 90 people are supporting us on Patreon. For a mere dollar an episode, that's $2 a month, you can get ad-free episodes, bonus behind-the-scenes info, give your opinion by answering polls, help choose episodes, and get updates on past episodes. For $3 an episode, you get monthly outtake reels. For $5, you get a monthly quiz episode, where I quiz my husband on past episodes. For $10, you get a detailed bibliography of all the resources I used while researching each topic. And for $20, you get a bit of miscellaneous morbidity, a short essay on a random morbid topic every month. Previously, we've reviewed horror video games, discussed the medicine of Westeros, and the plague pits of London. All of these rewards aside, your patronage supports the podcast and keeps new episodes coming. I can't keep doing this podcast without you, so go to bit.ly slash morbidpatron, that's b-i-t dot l-y slash morbidpatron, to choose your rewards and support the MCP. You'll have my eternal gratitude. And now, back to the podcast.
According to Howell's account, 146 adults were packed into the black hole by resentful guards of the Nawab. The black hole was not meant for more than two or three people at a time, and the room was so packed that the guards had difficulty closing the door. The room had only two small barred windows, and the luckiest prisoners were near these. However, the night was so warm, and no breeze was blowing, so it did them little good. Several people tried to bribe the guards through the window to let them out, but they refused to be bargained with. Howell stated that by 9 p.m., several people were dead, and many others were delirious from the heat. One guard brought water to one of the windows, and all the prisoners surged toward him, crushing and trampling each other for a mere taste of water. By 11 p.m., prisoners were falling fast, and those left alive did their best to climb to the top of what was fast becoming a heap of the dead. According to Howell, when the door was opened at 6 a.m. by the Nawab's commander, only 23 people remained alive. Most had to be pulled out from the corpses to leave the room. Howell reported that fresh air soon revived him and the other survivors. He said the Nawab scolded his guards and brought chairs for the prisoners, but did not regret the deaths of the Englishmen. The corpses were thrown into the Maratha ditch, and the prisoners were moved to Morshidabad, the capital of Bengal. Howell's account was first written down in a personal letter to a friend, and then published in a book a year or so later. It was taken as fact at first, but by the late 1800s, early 1900s, issues with consistency between the two reports were noted, as well as several other things that made some scholars doubt its validity. However, there were others who vehemently supported Howell's account. In 1763, Robert Orme, who was a member of the council at Fort St. George in Madras between 1754 and 1758, and who became the official British historian of India in 1769, published the first English-language history of the Black Hole incident. Later in the 18th century, two scholars were great proponents of Howell's version of events. Colin R. Wilson, publishing in 1906, and S. C. Hill, publishing in 1905, believed that Howell's account was true. Both of these scholars were patronized by Lord Curzon of Kettleston, the British Viceroy of India between 1899 and 1905, who himself wrote in favor of Howell's account in 1925. It's possible that Lord Curzon may have been one of the people using the Black Hole incident as a way to show his British nationalism and gain favor after being passed over for Prime Minister of India in 1923. In 1916, J. H. Little, the British headmaster of the English high school in Morshidabad, wrote that Howell had vastly exaggerated the numbers in order to make himself out as a hero for surviving. Little pointed to inconsistencies between Howell's letter and his official account, and that Howell's account is only corroborated by people who were in league with him or repeating the tale. Little stated that the account also painted Howell as a hero who suffered through the night pinned to the window, only to be fully revived by a little fresh air the next morning. Little went as far as calling the story a giant hoax, and stated that it was more likely that more company men had made stealthy escapes than Howell had reported when the Armenian and Indian Portuguese prisoners were set free. Indian historian Sir Jadunath Sarkar wrote in 1943 of a Bengali landlord named Bolanath Chunder who fenced off an area similar to that of the Black Hole and observed how many of his tenants could cram themselves into it. The number was around 60. This story is more of a local legend, but it does make an argument for thinking about the physical capacity of the space, not just the historical sources. Sarkar also wrote that it's possible that after the battle, the people who disappeared or their cause of death was unknown could have been mistakenly or haphazardly put down as perished in the black hole. Modern Indian historian Brijan K. Gupta theorized in 1962 that while Howell overplayed the event, little may have underplayed it. The true number of people that were crammed into the black hole was somewhere between their numbers. 
Gupta came to this conclusion by analyzing the number of people reported present in the fort before the battle and the reported losses afterwards. Gupta also pointed out that no documents from Falta, where Howell and the other company men fled after their expulsion from Calcutta, made any mention of the Black Hole incident. There's also an absence of demand for compensation from the Nawab for lives lost at Fort William. This was a common practice of the company at the time. There are other accounts besides Howell's. However, Gupta makes a convincing argument that most of these other accounts can be traced directly back to Howell. Gupta theorizes that only one other person who actually survived the Black Hole incident was a man named George Gray. Gray wrote of his experience to the court of directors of the company in London. Another account, that of a man named Captain Mills, was written in his own pocketbook and is almost identical to that of Gray. The two men were in the same place soon after the incident, but Gray never mentioned Mills as a prisoner in the black hole, so it's likely Mills wasn't actually held in the prison, but, like many others did, decided to claim that he had been for the honor and renown placed on those who had survived. No list of prisoners was made by the Nawab's army. Therefore, we have to estimate the number of people left after the battle using the numbers recorded by the men of Fort William, before and after the incident. According to Governor Drake, when the Nawab's army arrived at Fort William, there were around 230 to 245 Europeans at the fort. Took and Lindsay, company agents who were at the fort on the 16th, reported between 225 and 235 Europeans. Therefore, a safe estimate is somewhere between 225 and 245 Europeans being present before the battle. On June 18th, a large number of Europeans deserted the fort, including Governor Drake. Howell gave the names of 52 people, Mills mentioned five other names, and Took one other name, giving a total estimate of around 58 people. Between four and six Europeans were sent to make ready the retreat ships and never came back. 56 Dutch soldiers defected to the Nawab, and more fled when they gave up the gate to the Nawab soldiers. An unknown number of Europeans then escaped with the Armenian and Indian Portuguese militia when they were allowed to leave the fort. This is possibly when Mills made his escape. After all the desertions and releases, around 143 Europeans remained. Out of those 143, Drake reported that 71 died in the fighting or in the black hole afterwards. 53 of those 71 can be accounted for as dying in battle. After Drake fled, another 23 Europeans were reported as dying by Howell. Having now accounted for the lives of around 212 to 230 Europeans, we are left with a more accurate estimate of around 60 people left to be taken prisoner in Fort William. That is still quite a lot of people for a space as small as the Black Hole. The number of people Howell reported to have survived the incident, 23, seems to be accurate which means it's more likely that around 40 people died that night instead of Howell's reported 123 deaths. Howell may have exaggerated, but there is no doubt that this event took place. Around 60 people, many with injuries and most starving and exhausted, were pushed into a space meant for at most six people and were left there overnight. Over half of them died, either from injuries sustained in the battle or due to conditions relating to overheating, exhaustion, dehydration, or starvation. After the Nawab took the fort, he moved his armies to Morshidabad in triumph. The surviving prisoners went with him and, according to Howell, walked the entire three miles there. The British East India Company responded with an attack of their own. Lieutenant Colonel Robert Clive marched a huge force down from Madras toward Calcutta. Through their infiltrations in the Mughal court, the company had learned that there were seeds of dissent among the Nawab's council. One man in particular, Mir Jafar, who I mentioned earlier, was already scheming to overthrow the Nawab. Together, the company and Mir Jafar planned a betrayal. When the two forces met at the Battle of Plassé, Mir Jafar advised the Nawab to retreat at one point during the battle. While he was in retreat, Clive attacked. 
Mir Jafar and the other mutineers' forces refused to fight, leaving the Nawab with an extremely reduced army. The Nawab was forced to flee. He was soon caught and executed by the company on July 2, 1757. Howell wrote his first account in a letter on July 17, 1756, and sent it to the Fort St. George Council in Madras. The book he wrote about the incident was published in February of 1757 and circulated widely back in Britain. News of the incident caused outrage among the British public, causing them to push Parliament into letting the British East India Company do whatever it felt necessary to pacify the indigenous people of India. Mir Jafar was installed as the Nawab of Bengal, with military support from the British East India Company. His rule didn't last long, however. The company discovered he was making deals with the Dutch East India Company, and he was quickly replaced with his son-in-law, Mir Kasim. However, Mir Kasim turned out to be a strong anti-company leader and was quickly removed as well. Mir Jafar was restored as the Nawab and ruled until his death in 1765. To this day, the name Mir Jafar is used in the Urdu language as a synonym for traitor. The Mughal Empire was formally dissolved after the Indian Rebellion of 1857, and instead of continuing to let a merchant company govern the country, the British Raj was installed by the Crown. This began a mostly peaceful era of British rule over India. After World War I, in which around one million Indians served, the non-violent Indian independence movement arose, led in part by Mahatma Gandhi. Siraj Udala became a symbol of opposition against the British, just as the Black Hole incident had been used as a symbol against the people of India in the mid-1800s. During the 1930s, slow legislative reform was enacted by the British, and the Indian National Congress won victories in the resulting elections. India became an independent nation in 1947. According to Partha Chatterjee, political theorist, historian, and author of The Black Hole of Empire, the confusing history of The Black Hole of Calcutta has brought two thoughts to the forefront. One, that the consequences of imperial impulses are never benign, and two, that resistance to that imperial impulse is often violent and mindless. Simply put, neither the British East India Company nor the Nawab of Bengal and his armies come out clean in this incident. This lack of solution is a common theme in many historic tragedies. There is no way to go back and fix the situation, and there are only so many documents to search before the trail runs cold. There just isn't enough information to learn the whole truth. The violence, the confusion, and the absence of closure surrounding the black hole incident is what draws out our curiosity. The Morbid Curiosity Podcast was produced by H. Lloyd. If you'd like to get in touch or suggest a morbid topic for me to talk about, you can tweet the show, at Morbid Podcast, or find us on Facebook and Instagram, at Morbid Curiosity Podcast. If you like the show, please share us on social media. And please, please, please give us a rating on iTunes. Your shares and ratings help us reach new listeners and expand this wonderfully creepy community. Thank you to everyone who commented, suggested topics, shared MCP posts, liked or followed the MCP on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and gave us ratings on iTunes. People like Anna, Abrielle, Nicholas, Connor, Joe, Steve, Oliver, Trace, Tori, Kari, Michelle, and Day. Steve and Oliver have my eternal gratitude for becoming patrons. Thank you so much. And I wish you luck and lots of natural 20s in all your future Dungeons & Dragons campaigns. Because of you, the listeners, our creepy community is growing, especially on Facebook, so head over there to engage with other listeners, discuss episodes and news articles, and share your own creepy stories and cute pet pictures. The MCP is part of a wider creepy community known as the Belfry Podcast Network. Check out the other shows on the Belfry Network at www.thebelfry.rip. As I said before, if you really like the MCP, 
please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. You can also give one-time donations by going to our website, www.morbidcuriositypodcast.com, and clicking the donate button. On our website, you can also find links to all our social media and sponsors, and other ways to contact us. If you'd rather contact us by mail, this address is also listed on the website. Another way to help the show is by going to our Amazon wishlist at bit.ly slash morbidwishlist. Any purchases from this list are greatly appreciated. We are eternally grateful for your support. My name is Hallie, and until next time, thanks for listening.